Our reading is a Mother's Day reading this morning. Uh, it was written by Reverend Linda Susan Ulrich. She's a minister, writer, musician, and activist dedicated to the vision of radical inclusion in both language and action. And she currently serves as assistant minister at the First Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Ann Arbor. I'll have the words up there for you, but I've asked Sherry Barr if she will read this. So Michael, if you could make sure Sherry Barr is unmuted. Oh, she is now, okay. Well, I will put the words up so Sherry can share with you. <clears throat> for all the mothers and mother figures, the grandmothers, aunts, and extended family members who mother, the soon-to-be mothers, the wish they were mothers, the never wanted to be mothers, the it's complicated mothers, the birth mothers, foster mothers, adoptive mothers, stepmothers, the used to be dad mothers, and more than one mom mothers, the single mothers, separated mothers, stay at home mothers, unhoused mothers, the grieving mothers, those who grieve their mothers, and those whose grief is complex. For all the communities that mother, and for all who depend on the great mother, you are held and beloved. Thank you to that, for reading that for us, the wonderful mother and grandmother, Sherry Barr. Once a year, I do a question box sermon, and I try to do it near Mother's Day. And um, it's the one sermon a year that I really don't prepare for. <laughs> and I usually have you come in and put your questions in a real box, and I pull them out one by one and do my best to answer them. They can be just about anything. So right now, what I want you to do is, I hope you have yours written out already that you can maybe just paste it in or whatever, but you can type it in. I'm gonna do a little thing where I do the unsharing and get back to the other thing and I'll talk my way through it so you all will know I'm still here. And you be going into the chat box. Um, Michael, will you go in and put question box or something like that? Well, I'll, I'll figure out what the question, what when it stops the the greetings from the questions. You don't have to do that. You go in the chat box and you write your question to me and I will try my best to answer as many as I can. I've punched my little watch thing here so I have a timer that goes off after 15 minutes. Now I know I need to kind of start wrapping it up, but we'll see what I can get done and what I can't get done there. Maybe I'll email the rest of them to you if I can. Some of them I may have to just say, I don't know. So type those questions in and um, and I'll do my best. Let's see, where are they? Somebody's gotta have me a question. Okay, here they come. Two questions, Jane, I have seen you on the front lines of social justice. Have you ever felt afraid? Are there other times you have felt afraid? A little bit. Uh, I'm not real fearful. I had the great privilege of being an old white woman who nobody's going to do much anything. You know, we're, we're pretty safe. You know, people, people view us as safe people. Like, oh, that's just a old white lady. She, we don't have to worry about her, you know. And that, that's kind of a privilege in a way. A privilege that I carry. I was, uh, I, like, of course, I was scared one time. Um, we had a um, uh, situation in Statesboro that uh, James Woodall, who's now our NAACP state president, he had a petition. Uh, and he told me the other day, it's because I, I, I asked and told him he needed to do something about that Confederate statue. I said, oh, I didn't know I caused all that problem. But he decided he would get a petition up and uh, and see if he couldn't get that Confederate statue moved from that courthouse. And then he took it to the county commissioners. Well, of course, the room was packed, mostly with folks that got there real early with their signs and flags, Confederate flags, all over the place. 
so there we were sitting in there with all that. And um, then uh, James got up to speak and uh, they were all right behind him with this mean look and these mean and these flags and stuff. And thankfully, Francis Johnson said, hey, look, told the commissioners, if you're going to allow this, if you go, this sets a precedent for anything else that comes up before these commissioners, whether it's something related to um, Planned Parenthood or whatever, you know, anything that may come up, you're going to have, you set a, you have set a, uh, a thing that you can, people can bring in signs and posters and flags and wave them if you let these folks stay in here and be intimidated with this. He said, these need to go. So they got to thinking about it and gotten worried about the precedent they were setting. And they said, okay, y'all got, you got to take them out. You can't have them in here. So those folks left and they went and stood out in the parking lot. So uh, I went up and stood behind James then to feel like he didn't say so have somebody in next to him. And I, I did speak as well um, and spoke as a Bullock County, somebody that grew up there, which folks did not like that. Cause I was, kind of saying, yeah, I, I, this, I know I'm, I'm talking to you from my perspective of understanding what you're like and what's going on and what's, what's happening here. And um, after, after that was over, I went out and my car was parked in a parking lot that was a one way, only one way you could get out. It was across the street from the back of that courthouse annex. And I, the way I had to get out, was to go between all those people standing there with those flags and stuff. And um, you know me, I used to have all those stickers on the back of my car and everything, and they know who I am too. Uh, and that I did, I, I did feel kind of scared then, but I just gritted my teeth and drove my car and got on through there. But that's minor, that's mild. You know, most of us don't. Other people, you know, have to worry about just running down the street, going to a store. Going to a swimming pool. Heavens. So, yeah, I've been scared a little bit, but not much. I, I, I've got too much privilege. Okay. Uh, are there other times you felt afraid? That was the second part of that question. Oh yeah, I've been afraid um, um, some um, when I'm doing some of this stuff a little bit, but I've always tried to be careful. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to go do something real. I mean, I, I and I'm gonna have people around me. I mean, I'm, I'm not, because um, I want to. I, I mean, I want to live. You know, I want to live another day to continue working. So I, I try to do things in a good way. I was scared of this, you know, this COVID virus thing. Feel like was I going to go to that protest and get put myself in the middle of those people? But I thought, well, if we all wear our masks, and I wrote to James Woodall, I said, please make sure everybody wears masks. He had them; they were handing them out there, masks and and hand sanitizer. The only person I saw without a mask was the chair. <laughs> they were all had the masks on, so that was good. So I felt very safe there. And um, uh, my question is about a mild Arbery. Comments about it. Um, as the mother of young men, I, and I see his mama talking, they lied to her about this. They told her when they, I wondered in his obituary what, why nothing was said about it. But what, what they told her was, says, your son was involved in a robbery and he was shot. That's what she was told. They kept this hidden so long. It's just so horrible. Um, one of the people at the at the protest said, you know, he had wanted to be in the NFL and he didn't make that. But his life is going to make an even bigger difference now. And I guess that's some consolation. It has to, because now we have to do something to honor him and he had to honor his life and honor his family by making sure that we change the system. It's not just, it's, it's a whole systemic problem. Um, and it's not just Glenn County. You all know how things are other places as well. But we sure got to do some work here. Another question. How do we show radical love in a time of such divisiveness? How do we build a bridge? Um, I'm in a group called Beloved Community. That's what we, we talk about, uh, bridging the gap, because we realize that's what we really need to do. We've got to build some bridges. There are ways. I mean, I've got relatives and friends that are on the 
very, very um, conservative on, on various issues that are very different from me. And there are ways that we can uh, talk and share with folks that can help bridge the gap because we can find things we have in common and try to reach, reach that humanity with them about those things we have in common. And, and, and we don't need to show hatefulness toward them. Many of them are just, they're not bad people. They've grown up in a bad system. And so we have to be understanding of that and work with that with love. And that's what I've, I've tried to do. Sometimes I have gotten angry and, you know, but I really tried when I do share with folks to share in a loving way. And, and I think many of you do as well. Um, so I encourage you to get involved with groups that do this. We've had some uh, things um, in some of our, in, in, I know in the Statesboro congregation, we had something where we went through this me method where we tried to learn how to, how to connect with folks who were very, very different by finding that commonality and, and moving from that. Okay. Uh, let's say you are singing or demonstrating, et cetera, in a group you love and respect, but you don't agree 100% with some of the language being used. Oh, yeah, that happens a lot to me. I'm thinking of a song like Amazing Grace or perhaps a demonstration like that for Ahmaud Arbery. What kind of little mental switch do you toggle so that you can participate wholeheartedly? I do a lot of translating, and I do uh, in my head about and, and, and to language that me, is meaningful to me. And I try to see what the message is under the words, what is under it. You know, somebody may have a different theology, but underneath that is love and caring, love and caring almost always. And you mentioned Amazing Grace, so I'll tell you that. I love that song because I do believe in Amazing Grace. And I've kind of think about it in a different kind of way. I, uh, one person that helped me do this with my, was my uh, friend Chris Bowen who told me one time, he said, um, Chris is a, a, a gay man, and he, he told me he grew up in a community, loved that song, but he couldn't sing it anymore because, you know, he was rejected by the church and this, that, and the other. And I told him, I said, well, Chris, you know, you could, you have had some amazing grace. I said, you, you had to be in a closet for a long time, and you were lost to your true self for a long time. But you, you were blind to your own true self and to what you could be. But now you can see. And you've had the amazing grace to be able to be out and be open. And that's an amazing grace. You were blind, but now you see. And he said, oh yeah, I, I see that now. And so we sang the song together. And, uh, and it meant a lot to him. So you can do those kinds of things. So just, just be there with them. I say when I'm, I'm in other places with other people with different theologies that when I'm with them, I ride in their car their theological car. I learned to do that when I was a chaplain. You had to go in all these rooms and be with these people that were sick and I'd find out what their background was. And I could hold their hand as we prayed to the goddess or, or, or Jesus or, or had a Buddhist chant, you know. I'm there to be with them in their theology to connect with them, help them connect to the divine in the way that they see to the divine. That's what I'm called on to do as a Unitarian Universalist pastor, I think because um, not everybody can do that, of course. There are pastors that say, no, I only can connect with mine. But I, I know that underneath it is that divine love we all share. So I don't mind if people use different words. Um, somebody else had the same question. Somebody said, since I graduated college, I'm curious what the best life advice you have ever received is and how it, and how it has affected you. Sarah Beth just graduated. Congratulations, Sarah Beth graduated. Woo! I'm sorry we can't have the usual to-dos that we do when people have these life-changing things like graduations. Uh, I know you miss out on some of that, but uh, we'll all, some people can chat congratulations to Sarah, Sarah Beth, on, Beth on here and to others who graduated and had some good things going on. Um, well, let me see if I can answer a question. The best life advice you ever received is. Okay. Well, it's Mother's Day. I'm gonna, I'll tell you the life advi advice that I got from my mama. And one Mother's Day, a long time ago, I wrote a song about it. 
So I'm going to try to sing you the song, okay, about my mama and my life advice. Watch some others. You put some more questions there, here. Let's see if I can remember. It says, uh, um, Mama worked hard to the edge of night. Then she cooked us all supper and she and we ate every bite. She gave us our baths and tucked us in tight and said, don't worry, children. It'll be all right. Mama done said it'll be all right. Mama done said it'll be all right. My worries are gone, they're out of sight, cause mama done said it'll be all right. I got a little older, got to go to school. My friend got mad, said I wasn't cool. Mama said it's not nice to be cruel, so you just follow that golden rule. Mama done said it'll be all right. Mama done said it'll be all right. My worries are gone, they're out of sight, cause mama done said it'll be all right. For too long and I was grown. Had problems with kids of my own. Went to mama to whine and moan. She said, love them all you can, cause they soon be gone. Mama done said it'll be all right. Mama done said it'll be all right. My worries are gone, they're out of sight, cause mama done said it'll be all right. Mama's getting older, walks a little slow. What'll I do if she ever does go? She says, just remember to let your love flow and dance all the way to the exit door. Mama done said it'll be all right. Mama done said it'll be all right. The worries are gone, they're out of sight, cause mama done said it'll be all right. <laughs> so, you know, you just gotta know, you gotta get through some stuff, but it'll be all right. Just keep dancing all the way to the exit door. It'll be all right. All right, Jane, what is the hardest thing you have ever had to do? And the death, dealing with the death of my son this past December. That even singing that song, that they'll soon be gone. Love them all you can, they'll soon be gone. I didn't think he would be really gone before me. But having your own child die and burying your child, that's, that's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. What keeps you daily uplifted? Love, <laughs> wherever I can get any. I'm very blessed to have people that love me. I'm very blessed to have you folks. I, 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 Unitarian Universalism is my salvation. Somebody says, are you saved? I say, yes, because <laughs> I am loved by you. Love keeps me going. It keeps me uplifted. I try to find, I try to connect with somebody who's loving somebody. They say, you know, Mr. Rogers said, find the helpers. I try to connect with somebody who's loving somebody. And if they're loving me, that's really good. Connect, but it, they don't have to be loving me. Just connect with somebody loving somebody. Now, this is as we connect more and more virtually, it becomes easier to simplify people and see them as more two-dimensional like we are here, I guess. Do you have any advice about loving the whole person and not just throwing out every way of connecting with people because you're so sick of students cheating and justifying it and the conspiracy theories and what you have? How do you stay connected and loving? It is harder in this two-dimensional world. I'm glad we have it, thank goodness. Um, but you can find someone your dog or your cat or your, or your partner or somebody that you can put your arms around, that helps. Sherry Barr showed me that her daughter showed her how she could hug her, put a sheet over her head and put her arms around her. And after my mama's little sister died recently, I've had a lot of grief in my life recently. My mama's little sister died and I went over there and let her see the, the way she went to the funeral was watching the video with me. I would not even been in her house before then because I tried to make sure I was real careful around her, but I got all cleaned up and ready. We watched the video. And then I went and got, I said, Mama, where do you keep your clean sheets? And she told me, she said, why? I said, well, I'm a, well, just wait, I'm coming back. And I got back and I said, now stand up, hold on to this little thing so you won't fall, stand up. And she, she realized, what she said, you're going to hug me, aren't you? I said, yeah, Mama, I'm going to give you a hug. And I was able to put that sheet over her and give her that hug after she watched her little sister's funeral. And so we can find ways. It's harder. It is harder to, but we can find ways. So I'm going to end it with that, with saying, 
I'm going to send you all a virtual hug. I know it's not real, but you put your arms around yourself like this and know that I'm hugging you. You feel it? You feel it? We all hugging each other. I love you so much. And if you have other questions later on, I'll try to answer it. But that is my Mother's Day sermon for today.